Hello and welcome to this webinar hosted by Director in conjunction with Nuance. Today we're going to look at workplace efficiency. The productivity gap in the UK is at its worst since records began. UK businesses are currently less competitive than other G7 nations. So, what can we do to make each hour work really count? Can small changes really add up to bigger bucks? In this webinar, we're going to hear from three workplace efficiency experts. Our first speaker will be Richard Mabry. Richard is an efficiency specialist and vice chair of IOD Surrey. And then we'll hear from Gary May. Gary is an efficiency software and assistive technology specialist and is MD of Freedom of Speech. And we'll round things off by hearing from Graham Blenkinsop. Graham is the MD of Wise Move and an advocate of workplace efficiency. What we'll hopefully hear today from our speakers is how to use technology to drive efficiency and how to reduce time management related stress and improve work-life balance. We also intend to run three polls. And before we finish, we'll deal with any questions that are submitted. We're keen to answer your questions, so please do submit them as we go. Simply type your question into the box and then press send. Okay, we've got a lot to get through in the next 45 minutes, so we're going to go straight to our first poll. And that poll will appear on your screens in just one second. And the first poll question is, what's the biggest challenge to efficiency and productivity in your workplace? What is the biggest challenge to efficiency and productivity in your workplace? Is it email? Is it meetings? Is it other admin? Or is it something else or you don't know? Okay, I'll just give you a couple of seconds to vote on that one. What is the biggest challenge to efficiency and productivity in your workplace? Email, meetings, other admin, or something else? Don't know. Okay, we're going to close the poll now. And some very interesting results there. We're going to come back to the results in just a second and take a look at them. Uh, but without any further ado, it's time for me to hand you over to our first speaker. And our first speaker is going to be Richard Mabry. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I um, hope you're well. And uh, today I'm going to uh, run through uh, some ideas uh, around um, workplace efficiency. And uh, the first thing that we need to recognize is that um, in the real world, a whole pile of people get up and go to work thinking about, worried about, excited about even, um, and even sometimes planning what they have to do today. They get into work and then something happens. And they sometimes feel, because everything is flying um, at them left and right, they sometimes feel like they're surfing on the edge of chaos continually. And the thing is that they leave work often with much of what they thought they would do today undone, thinking, what on earth happened there? Good people. Good people who um, are able and willing to get up and go through this day by day, good people who are already working hard to achieve something for their employer, themselves, and those they're responsible for. Now, having supported thousands of people over the years, delivering their critical results easier within their busy days, I know that most people can't work any harder. So the deal is they have to work um, smarter. And bottom line is that everybody with a half-decent job has got a job and a half to do. And the focus of my training is around personal productivity and team productivity. And I'll address both of those constituencies in this short overview. But I want to start with uh, the whole teaming thing, because as business leaders, we know the importance of purpose and values and vision and mission and culture and strategy. And we all work hard to manifest this. But the reality is that uh, when people are uh, working at, at work, I'm just going to try and get this. Um, yeah, the slides aren't moving. When people are working at work, um, they're, you've got a whole pile of individuals. And these individuals have got individual approaches to email management and commitment management. And the different numbers and different ways of managing email and commitments are as many as the number of people in your team. Now, the um, fact of the matter is that um, if, I, sorry, I'm, I'm, I can't make this, uh, this slide move. If someone can help me with the slide, that would be great. The, the fact of the matter is that there's an awful lot of um, talk around collaboration these days. And with collaboration, uh, there has to be some sort of standard approach. Now, we're not talking about straitjackets here, uh, but 
Jack Welch was right. Values are just behaviors, nitty-gritty behaviors that are so transparent they leave nothing uh, to the imagination. And when you and I are looking to drive value through our business, we have to uh, think about um, how our people will deliver and drive that value through the business. Next slide, please, because this is not working. So, um, with the current work environment, with the current work environment, uh, you've got a whole pile of people who feel empowered, who are empowered, but there must be a basis from which we can work better together. I call this esprit de corps. Next slide, please. I call this esprit de corps. And esprit de corps for, uh, for us is a shared common set of principles, processes, and tools that unite a diverse group towards a common goal. And really, esprit de corps is where the nitty-gritty behavior meets the lofty purpose. So uh, moving on to the next slide and my sort of tips. And when I'm thinking about tips, I do take my cue from the medical profession. Next slide, please. Because the medical profession um, suggests and says, actually, um, under oath, that prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. That said, um, I will cover um, five broad productivity principles here and share those with you. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, first thing I would suggest is we must weld our purpose to our priorities every day. You and I know that tips and tricks and, and hacks never deliver sustained productivity improvement. And most people, I would suggest, do not have a golden thread between their uh, purpose and their priorities. Sometimes uh, there is that thread, but it, it, it's not always visible, not always obvious, it's taken for granted, and it can be wishy-washy. In fact, purpose is often pulled out in times of crisis when critical deadlines loom or when performance is called into question. So three specific, actually two specifics, I do beg your pardon. The first specific, consider using your Outlook categories, your Google labels, to define the key result areas of your role and the strategic projects that you deliver alongside your day job. You know, categories um, and labels are too powerful just to differentiate between internal and external meetings, good though that might be. The second tip in this area I would suggest is that, you know that place in your calendar where you put your mum's birthday and the colleague's leave days? Use that to define your categorized milestones and critical delivery dates for your critical work flow. Because this visibility helps us to create and control our own tension for change against the long-term objectives. Next slide, please. Second uh, productivity principle, um, Dr. Pareto was right. I'll try and move this. Doc I can't move it. Thank you. Dr. Pareto was right. Uh, the law of inverse proportionality is universal. It applies all the time, and it's not the 50-50 law. Peter Drucker was right also when he said back in the day, um, successful leaders don't start out asking, what would I like to do? Uh, they start out asking, what needs to be done? And to answer that question successfully, we need to know what we have to choose from. What's in the plan for the day? Where does the plan live? How comprehensive is it? I'll cover these and more shortly. But first, next slide please, productivity pointer three. Dr. Pavlov was right. We have to acknowledge that um, Dr. Pavlov in his famous uh, conditioned response experiments with dogs, foods, and bells was right. But we also have to acknowledge how much we have allowed ourselves to have a conditioned response to this stimuli. So a couple of pointers around this, because it is insidious. A couple of points around it. One. When you open up your Outlook or your G Suite account, where does it open? <laughs> Almost everyone's opens in the one place that rewards reactivity and triggers conditioned responses, the inbox. 
change how these programs open. It's quite straightforward. To show you your planned prioritized meetings and tasks for the day in the context of the rest of the week and in the context of your critical results and milestones. Two, liberate yourself from the tyranny of email alarms, alerts, and pop-ups that destroy your ability to focus on delivering what needs to be done in the moment. And three, reduce your default calendar reminder time to the bare minimum necessary to take action on moving forward um, on your uh, critical results, avoiding um, time delays. Next slide, please. Uh, the fourth productivity pointer I'd like to share with you is what I call rules for tools. Too many good people use too many tools. In fact, they have an unconscious to-do list. And really, most of their to-dos are in their memory. And Dr. Homer Simpson was right. Um, every time I think of something new, some old stuff falls out of my brain. And this encourages the myth of multitasking. So we would say very strongly, next slide, please, uh, use fewer tools and integrate them better. And the next slide, because most people live in continuous partial attention mode, and most people fractionalize their attention span. Next slide, please. Um, finally, um, tools are great. I love technology. You know, most of my client, most most of my work is with clients using technology, uh, but tools belong at the end of the chain, the value chain. And the final slide, please. Because um, tools like Outlook are 21 years old uh, last month. And we, it's not a question of using new and better tools. It's a question of using the tools we've already got better together. And the final slide. So my final point here, guys, is that um, even though technology is wonderful, sometimes it is still down to the quality of the question. Uh, and the quality of the question determines the quality of the outcome always. I'm happy to take any other questions as we move forward. But for now, final slide, thank you. Smashy, thanks very much, Richard, for an excellent overview. Um, we're going to come back and ask Richard a few questions a little later. But we're just going to re review the uh, first poll that we sh uh, looked at, at just before. And we'll review that poll now. Uh, we're displaying the poll results, and you'll see that um, from the first poll question, what's the biggest challenge to efficiency and productivity in your workplace? 31% felt that email was the big challenge, 19% uh, meetings, 34% other admin, and 18 other or don't know. Okay, those are interesting results, and I'm going to talk to the, each of our speakers about those results in the Q&A at the end. But before we get to that, it's going, we're going to hear from our second speaker. And our second speaker is Gary May, and I'll just hand control over to him now. And over to you, Gary, to take it away. Thank you, and good afternoon to all. A brief introduction. My name is Gary May, and I am the managing director of a company called Freedom of Speech. I've been working with access to work and workplace efficiency for over 17 years now, and seen some remarkable changes in both attitudes to workplace efficiency and equally amazing improvements in the technologies that are available. The first area I'd like to cover today is the access to work grant. I'm sure that many of you here today have heard of access to work. There is still a lot of misunderstanding surrounding this and what we as an employer need to understand to ensure we are not in breach of the Equalities Act. But more importantly, this grant can help you retain an employee who develops a disability or long-term aggressive condition. So what is access to work and who is eligible for funding? The official line is access to work is a specialist government disability service delivered by the Job Centre Plus. It gives practical advice and support to disabled people, whether they are working, self-employed or just looking for employment. Access to work is provided where someone needs adaptations beyond the reasonable adjustments which an employer is legally obliged to provide under the Equalities Act. To be eligible for help, a person must have a disability or health condition that has a long-term substantial adverse effect on their ability to carry out their job. In employment, or just about start paid employment, including self-employment. It's probably worth pointing out that access to work does not provide the support itself, but provides a grant to reimburse the cost of the support that is needed. I need to go to my slide. 
two. So what is the process of starting this? The employer would firstly contact Access to Work to qualify if they're eligible for funding and assistance. Then, once qualified, Access to Work would then identify if an assessment is required. If so, there would be an undertaking of the individual's workplace by the assessor. Off the back of an assessment, recommendations would be made and the individual would receive an offer of funding and suggested providers. In certain cases, the Access to Work grant will not fund all 100% of the funding required. And my next slide will show you how this works. Next slide. When cost sharing applies, Access to Work will fund in the region of 80% of the approved cost between a threshold and £10,000. As the employer, you will contribute 100% of the cost up to the threshold level and 20% of the cost between the threshold and £10,000. So to make more sense of this, um, if you just look here on the 0 to 49, there is a 0% uh, zero contribution and 50 to 249, that's a 500 pound excess there and over 250 employers, a thousand pound excess. So for example, if you had 250 employers plus and you were granted a full 10,000 pound, less the excess will leave you 9,000 grant then less 20% contribution, total award of 7,200. I hope that will make sense. So moving on from access to work. Voice recognition is far more than just putting accurate text on screen. With the enterprise range of the technology, you are able to create workflow commands which simplifies usage and improves productivity. For example, commands for a GP could be created called referral letter or add clinical note which would then carry out a string of processes which could automatically bring up a blank referral letter or blank clinical note, ready for the text to be dictated. So with this in mind, here's a real life example of how the new generation of voice recognition technologies can really make a difference. Let's go to my next slide. This is based on a recently released white paper from a GP surgery, which is pretty compelling narrative. So within this statement, they are stating that four more patients can be seen each day by using voice recognition, which doesn't sound a lot, but if you consider the average working week for a doctor is six days, it means a total of 24 more patients can be seen per week. Average duration of employment is 10 minutes, 24 patients times 10 minutes, 240 minutes saved per week using voice recognition, around four hours per week. If they worked for an average of 42 weeks per year, the total time saving is 168 hours saved per annum average GP salary of £80,000 per annum, which equates to around £1,538 per week, totaling 2.3 weeks saved per annum, a minimum of £3,500 saving per GP per year. For us as a company, speech technologies have been driving force within assistive technology and more recently other areas such as the NHS, banks, energy companies, retail and many more. It's only been in recent years that the technology has evolved to a level which surpasses expectation and thus supporting the productivity that can now be achieved. The older versions of the software were slow and inaccurate and required a lot of time investment to get the recognition where you wanted it to be. Now with some basic training you can look at achieving near perfect recognition within the first few hours of using it. Thank you for your time today and I understand that there will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Thank you. Smashing, thanks very much Gary, uh, excellent overview there. We're going to come back and ask Gary a few questions um, about his presentation in a little while. But it is time now for us to run our second poll. And the second poll will uh, appear on your screens in just a second. Uh, and the poll should be with you now. And the second poll question is, is your workplace fully inclusive? Is your workplace fully inclusive? Um, is the answer yes, 100%? Is it for the most part with capacity for adaptation? Definitely requires adaptation or don't know. I'll just run through that quickly for you again. Is your workplace fully inclusive? Is it yes, 100% for the most, most part with capacity for adaptation? Is it definitely requires attention or is the option I don't know? Okay, just give you a couple of seconds to finalize your voting there and then we should be able to go straight to the results. Okay, I'm just going to sh share the results with you now. And it's a very interesting spread that 42% uh, 
say, uh, for the most part, but with some room for uh, capacity for adaptation. That's something we'll come back to uh, later on, but it's also pleasing to see that 26% are 100% full. Okay, right, now we've dealt with that poll and we're going to move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is, is Graham. Um, and Graham runs Wise Move, which is a land and property consultancy. And his firm has an interesting workplace efficiency and as such started using voice recognition software in its business. And so we're asking him a few questions about how that has gone. Okay, um, hi Graham. Hi folks, how are you doing? Excellent, excellent. Okay, so can you maybe just give us a quick overview? Um, what challenges were you facing at WiseMove that made you decide to start using uh, voice recognition software? And in effect, probably a question before that, did you always thought, think that voice recognition software is what you need, or were you just out there looking for a tool to improve efficiency? When we first started using uh, voice recognition technology, it was fairly new to the marketplace, and we were uh, reliant at the time on um, dictation, but utilizing the old tape measures and handing the tape to a secretary. Um, we would hand the tape to a secretary on a Monday and get the report typing back on the Tuesday. It was that inefficient. So we were looking for technology that would be more advanced and give us a much quicker turnaround on the, on the reporting that we were doing at the time, which was surveys of properties, which were uh, client contact letters, etc., which were uh, there was a necessity to get them out much quicker than what was uh, available to us at the time. So we were looking for alternative means of uh, communication. Okay, and how does it help you manage your workflow? Could you just describe to me sort of typically what's changed? Yeah, I mean, at the, again, at the time we would, we would dictate, we would use a, the old-fashioned tapes, we would hand that to the secretary, the secretary would type them, we would have to review, we would have to send out the reports, you know, 24, 48 hours later. What's changed subsequently with the implementation of the new and Dragon dictation software is the ability for me to think, dictate, see it actually appearing on the screen in front of me, making in any amendments, and being able to press the send button. Now, whilst that has done away with the need for a permanent secretary to, to type, that secretary can now undertake other administrative duties, which obviously don't involve dictation and typing, so we're much more efficient and the ability, as I say, to uh, dictate, see what we're dictating, have that transcribed, and have that sent out to a client almost immediately via email is fantastic for our business. 150 to 200 emails a day can leave my office now, where at the time, uh, dictating into a, a, an old-fashioned tape machine and transcription machine would, would limit that to in the region of 30 to 40 letters per day. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Um, so, do your customers see a difference in the service they're getting from you? And, and if so, what sort of difference is that? It's speed of response. If we if we receive an email inquiry now, it's it's much easier to incorporate the dictation using the transcription software. Emails, if we are in their office when the emails are received, are, are, are almost immediate. And I think that's the world we're living in now. If somebody sends you an email or if somebody makes a phone call to your office, they're asking for a speed of response which let's be fair we're all expecting in our own service industries when we go out and buy something we're expecting a speed of response what this software enables for us is the opportunity to be able to respond uh, much quicker much quicker than we've ever been able to historically um, hence the reason why I've been an avid supporter of the software system for 16 17 years now okay super and you've been using it for that long it's um, and uh, ha ha did it from day one? Did you notice change, and how has your use of it changed over the time you've been using it? Well, the, so the software, like any uh, software, it gets better. And it, it, going back 15, 16 years ago, it certainly wasn't infallible. Uh, there were problems with dictation and understanding what you were saying, but it's my northern dialect that I was to blame there. So I've become much more eloquent and uh, well spoken over the course of the time of using the software but even now it picks up on my dialect and it picks up on the opportunity for me to speak openly uh, speak the way I would normally speak it understands what I'm speaking um, and therefore the ability to get emails out professional emails professional letters dictated and transcribed properly has been an absolute boom to our business oh, just on that point has it made you helped you make savings as a business 
It has, uh, in the sense that I would normally have uh, two secretarial staff, but those two secretarial staff, one of which is now a fee earner, um, because they're able to concentrate on the work that they're doing and also utilize the software, um, whereas that individual some years ago was, was employed to be uh, administrative and secretarial. They're now doing work that's actually productive. Um, so I do my job, she does hers, one of my other colleagues in the office, he does his, we're all using the software and utilizing the software and they're now within the business all becoming fee earners as opposed to administrative support. They've still got their own administrative duties which are outside of the, uh, the, the, the normal typing responsibilities that once were there but the ability to now go out and actually fee earn um, and utilize the software to our advantage has definitely made, made savings within our business but more importantly generated more income for our business because they become fee earners and not general administrators. And you, you said that does, is the software used widely across the business? Does everyone use it, or is it a select few with, with key roles? Um, I, I think uh, it's fair to say that one of my surveying team um, will not use the software because he's reluctant to change. He's you know likes to type using the keyboard, but his productivity levels aren't as high as the other people in the office. He gets that, he understands it, but it's just him. And the guy is what 62 year old as a surveyor. Um, so his productivity levels aren't at the same levels as other people and he's the only one in the office not using and utilizing the software. Okay, I just wondered if you could perhaps give, because um, uh, obviously you had a, an implementation phase, um, uh, what advice would you give to other people who are, who are thinking of taking up and using a, a bit of technology like this? I think the implementation uh, is, it, in fairness, it's straight out of the box. The ability to be able to buy the software You've got to go through a process of training for the uh, for the software that we we use, um, but that training is 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, you are reading in your normal way from a from a, a, a script that uh, enables the software to understand your dialect, understand the way you speak, to train you how to use the system. So for anybody thinking about utilizing the system or buying it and thinking that well I'm not going to do it because it'll be weeks and weeks of training, that's absolute rubbish. Um, it's the ability to, to take it straight from the box, the ability to set the software system up and however long that takes, minutes, um, and then the ability for 20 or 30 minutes to be set aside for you to actually train the software and for the software to train you. Um, it's, it's an out of the box product. For us, if it was any different, I would probably have reservations. We've all got a working life, we've all, all got uh, work that we must undertake that's uh, set aside from dictation and transcription. Uh, but the out-of-the-box product is is ideal for us, and uh, it would be ideal for anybody else, I'm sure. Smashing. Okay. Thank you very much, Graham. That's a very useful uh, insight. Um, don't go anywhere. We're going to turn to you in just a second with a few more questions. But before we okay. turn uh, to the to broader questions, we're just going to run our third poll. And for all of you, the participants, you'll see on your screens in just a second the uh, third poll. And there it is. And the last poll is, what's the biggest barrier? What's the biggest barrier to making cost-effective cost effective efficiency improvements in your workplace? What's the biggest barrier to making cost-effective efficiency improvements in your workplace? Is it a lack of budget? Is it a lack of board level buy-in? Other priorities are more pressing, or you don't know? I'll just run you through that again. What's the biggest barrier to making cost-effective efficiency improvements in your workplace? Is it a lack of budget, lack of board level buy-in, other priorities are more pressing, or don't know? Okay, we'll just give you a couple of seconds to vote on that one. Okay, I think that should be long enough for everyone to vote. So we're just gonna close the poll, and then we're gonna have a look at the results. And you'll see it's quite interesting, 55% of people said that other priorities are more pressing, 17% um, lack of budget, 13% lack of board level buy-in, 16% uh, don't know. Okie dokie. Uh, right, let's turn to um, our panellists now and uh, ask them some questions. By the way, if you have a question you'd like to put to one of our speakers, feel free to submit it, we can still get to those. Okay, Richard, I wanted to turn to you first and maybe just ask you about that last poll. Um, it, I mean, do, 
do those sort of the results that we got there? Fifty five percent feel that other priorities are more pressing, but seventeen percent lack of like, budget, thirteen percent lack of broad level buy in. I mean, does that chime with what you see in on your day to day basis? Absolutely, and uh, one of the things that um, it, and and it is natural, and everybody on this call understands this. Um, the the stuff that's not pressing urgent right now is the sort of stuff that doesn't get done. Uh, it doesn't get done to the last minute very often. Um, and the reality is that we need to think how we invest our time now to make the future easier. And there are other priorities, but when you look at your priorities in the longer term, not just in the expediency of the moment, sometimes those decisions are easier to make. So um, I, I think a lot of people are addicted to urgency. And um, it's not because they're bad people. They're addicted to urgency. They've got to get stuff out the door now. But really, if we can build that tension for change I spoke about, um, it is easier for us to make non-urgent but more important decisions in the moment and, and not consign those things to when the office is empty or for many business owners at the weekend. Um, if it's important, do it now. Okay, Smashy, thank you very much. Graham, if I could turn to you, if I may. Um, I just want to ask you about again about uh, uh, another poll. In, in our first poll, we asked, what's the biggest challenge to efficiency and productivity in your workplace? And 31% of people said email. Now, you gave us quite a, a, a very vivid run-through of uh, the kind of challenges uh, that you face and were overcome in your business. But does that sound familiar to you? Did, do you find that was, was, is email a big, a big clogger, or was it more problematic before you introduced uh, this voice recognition system? Emails are a considerable uh, part of our business. We receive uh, bank valuation instructions via email. We've got to respond to those uh, within a 24-hour period due to service level agreements that we have with the lenders. Um, doing that on the old system was nigh on impossible. Uh, the ability to do that now on the uh, transcription software system and respond uh, to post valuation queries, for example, uh, it, it, it has improved productivity enormously. Uh, I get Richard, Richard's point that uh, you've got to respond in a timely manner and take time to respond properly and formally, but within our business, um, the necessity to respond promptly and quickly is there under a contract, so uh, the software enables us to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Gary, I'll, I'll turn to you, uh, if I may. Um, in the example you were giving, um, you talked about workflow commands and about how effectively, uh, uh, presumably a doctor would call this up and, um, and to, to start entering de uh, data on screen. Um, then you're not similar away from the uh, situation that Gary, Gary uh, Graham talked us through. Um, how, how does that work exactly? Do, does, can a doctor sort of call up a command, start detailing out a letter, and then will they finalize using their keyboard or can they edit it in some other way? Well, I think sort of looking where the technology has originally come from, which was disability, you can do everything pretty much by, um, by voice. You don't have to actually use uh, the mouse or keyboard. But I think it's looking at the workflow that people do on a daily basis that simplifies it but also makes it more efficient. So I think a lot of people remember the technology many, many years ago where the recognition wasn't so good and therefore um, the take on, on on the actual technology was very low. But where we are now, as I alluded to earlier, it, it's, it's, it's evolved significantly. So I think that's why we're seeing a lot more buy-in with the technology these days. So uh, the workflow commands are one part of it, but it's, it's, it's a part that people don't understand. As I alluded to, there's a lot more to voice recognition than just talking on the screen and seeing the text appear accurately. It will, um, it will simplify the actual usage of it with these workflow scripts commands. Smashing, thank you. Uh, Richard, I'll come back to you and ask you a sort of a broader question if I may. Um, can you give us a sort of an overview of some of the, we've talked specifically about a specific case here, but maybe you could give us some, an overview of some of the bigger efficiency challenges that face business as a whole in the UK? Gosh, that is a massive question, isn't it? I, I, would, I would say that um, in my experience, uh, Leaders know what they want to achieve in their business. Their, their values, vision, mission, um, you know, culture, they're all, leaders work hard at making that happen. The biggest challenge is that not everybody works in, in you know, the same way. And not everybody uses the same technology the same way. So, so it starts to fall down. And yes, we do 
have to recognize individuality. But when we're collaborating, when we're um, getting orders out the door, when we're dealing with escalations, when we're sort of looking at, at driving a project through the business and the, into the client, um, we do need to um, actually sacrifice some of that sort of um, uh, personal approach to a common set of standards, to some sort of approach that we as a team can use across the team to work better together. So I think I think there's I, I think it's not a challenge with leadership. I, I, I think I think it's a challenge with um, with, with the individuals um, working better together. Um, one client said to me the other day, "I've got a whole pile of really great people here, but we we work too hard to get stuff done." And I think that's the challenge. So some element of standardization, just because we can create inbox folders and subfolders, just because we can color code calendars, just because we can uh, bring apps into uh, our business because we have um, sort of a bring your own type approach and a, and a personalized menu approach to workload management, doesn't mean to say that we can't have some standard approach to how we do it here. I think that's the challenge. Okay, thank you very much. If we've got time, I'm going to come back to you with a couple more questions. Gary, I'll just come back to you, if I may. Um, could you give give me a sort of um, one of the questions that's come in has, is asking about specifically about workflow scripting commands. And um, could you sort of mm. maybe just explain what that what that is, and maybe give some examples of how that might work? Mm. So, um, just any in-house application, essentially, that an end user would end up clicking on a specific process to bring a document up or a specific workflow to bring some client records up and things like that. And what you're effectively doing with the technology is gluing those processes together and strapping them in as a voice command. So, if I was to say, a new document or um, date stamp that, it will go through the process to save somebody having to manually go in using Word or whatever the application may be to go through those processes. So by one word, it can you can undertake 15 processes. It can You could say a command, for instance, send that email to Paul and copy in John and Simon, and it will go through those processes. So when you collectively add all those processes up, there's a definitive time saving on that on that benefit. So it's, it's breaking down almost a role and then putting it back together in a voice format. And once you've done that, that can obviously be given and, and given to all the other users that are using the technology as well. So it's, it's sort of like creation of it and then deploying it to the relevant users so they benefit from that. And combine that with the level of accuracy you're getting as well now, this is where those efficiencies can be acquired. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Graham, I wanted to come back to you now with a, with a question. Um, this is a very sort of a specific case, really. I mean, I suppose uh, within any industry, and uh, there is sort of highly specialised language or sort of jargon that we that we use. Um, how, when you're dealing with a, a piece of voice recognition software or efficiency technologies of this kind, um, how do you have to change the way the way you you say things, or, or does the technology learn, or or can you teach it about specialist language or jargon, which is in common usage? I think the the crucial thing for the software is is to be a little bit more precise and eloquent than you would ordinarily be in general speech. For example, when speaking with a friend or a colleague in the office, you you can say things in shortened versions and they understand you because that's the human brain. Um, the, the, the software technology will never uh, react in the manner that the human brain does, but it's the closest thing now to excellence than uh, it was years ago. Uh, th there were, as I said, dialect problems. Uh, I would speak in a northern dialect uh, to the software. It would not understand certain things. So I have trained myself that when speaking with uh, the software that I am uh, more precise, more eloquent. Uh, there are certain terms and terminology within the surveying industry as there are in the medical industries that are, I would guess, fairly unique to the software. But the software trains itself. So there's things now that we are replicating in our speech and in our dictation that uh, is learned and understood by the software where originally it wasn't, where, whereas now it is. Um, and there are very, very rare occasions where we have to correct the software. It's always wise, always wise, to review what you've dictated and what is transcribed to ensure that there are no slippages in the technology. But that, I think, is common practice in any event. If you're going to send something out, double check what you're sending out.
course, yeah. Thank you very much. That's uh, really useful information. Richard, I want to come back to you, if I may. Um, we, talked in, uh, we talked in quite a lot in general terms about efficiency, but um, is, um, is productivity and efficiency a sort of a bigger problem for some businesses than, than for others? I mean, are there sector-specific problems that maybe you've come across in your day-to-day, -day, or does everyone sort of face uh, similar familiar challenges? I, I think everybody faces uh, similar challenges. Um, as I said in, in, in my brief overview, in the real world, you know, everybody with a half decent job has got a job and a half to do. That's not going to change either. So, so there's m massive pressures. Uh, at, you know, I, I work with pharmaceuticals, uh, technology, uh, business services, you know, accountancy firms, law firms. They all have the same challenge, you know, um, and um, it, it does boil, boil down to how, how on earth can I get through this stuff I've got to get through every day and still have a life. And um, everybody has the capacity to improve. Even, even things like, you know, voice recognition is cool stuff. I mean, I, I speak into my phone for most apps now. I don't tap onto the keyboard on my phone for most apps. But, um, but you know, um, the handwriting notes in OneNote in front of a client. Um, it makes my handwriting better because I want it to be recognized in OneNote easier. Uh, the same as Graham speaks more eloquently these days as a result of using, um, as a, as a result of using the nuance technology. Um, so I think, I, think there's, I think there's efficiencies that we all walk over because we all have habits that are deeply ingrained and sometimes we need to challenge ourselves. Um, on those habits, and just because they worked for us last quarter or last year, doesn't mean they're going to work for us next year. Okay, super. Thank you very much. If you were just, if you were to give one key bit of advice for sort of it, uh, in terms of workplace efficiency, what would it be? Ah, I, I'd say, I'd say, um, and, and again, this is this is quite an esoteric question, but it's really important. I'd, I'd say, um, look at your default and look at the pirates that you allow yourself to sort of uh, to sort of work with your productivity pirates in the same way as you would uh, look at those in somebody you didn't have very high regard for because we all have the capacity to criticize others when actually uh, we allow ourselves to do things and get away with stuff that we know isn't the best thing to be doing and the best way to be doing it um, and we all have a propensity to last minuteitis and we all have a propensity to sacrificing the important for the urgency. And I think, I think that would be my top tip. Use, use this Christmas and New Year period, the interregnum. Use this as a time to radically review the way you're currently churning your way through workload every day. Because the chances are you can find better ways uh, to be more efficient and more effective and, and actually deliver your results a little bit easier in 2018. But it does take a bit of objectivity and letting go of some of our default and habitual behaviors. Okay, thank you very much. Graham, I wanted to come back to you um, with, with one of the audience questions. Um, the audience question says that some gurus say we should only look at email, say, twice a day and use the rest of the time to work on our priorities. But it, 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 so I'd like your view on that. Presumably email is one of your priorities. And so, and, and so is that, is that you tend to be your focus around email or do, you, or do you sort of try and sort of look at it in key parts of the day? The market's changed within our industry and I guess it's the same in any other industry. We receive very few letters of correspondence. The majority of correspondence we now receive is via email. We receive in the region of 150 to 250 emails per day. Um, if people don't get a response within half a day, they're on the email again asking, did you get my email? So we've got to be seen to be responsive. Um, and I guess that's in general business in any event. Uh, in our surveying industry, under contracts that we have with the lenders, there is a timed responsibility for us to respond, and there's a, uh, we, we've got that responsibility. This this software enables us to do that. We haven't we haven't got the time to hand type uh, the responses and the individual responses that we create that time by using this software. So, yeah, things have changed. Um, email is absolutely prevalent. And within our business, it's, it's a primary source of communication. Uh, phone calls are much reduced. Letters to the office are much reduced. Emails to the office. I think within any walk of life, in any industry, in any business, emails are paramount. And it's, uh, it's people's expectancy and expectation to get a speed of response 
uh, and again without this without this ability to dictate and have the transcription appear, we 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 lose that opportunity of instant communication. Okay, thank you very and, much. And if, and if I could just just add to that just just quickly, um, we always ask our clients people when we're running workshops, what is your biggest productivity pirate, uh, and stops you sort of um, focusing on what you need to focus on every day. And the top answer has been email. Um, Correct. Or, more, more years than I care to mention. So very much it is about how the hell do we manage uh, the, the tsunami of emails and real work um, every day. I think Gary, thank you very much well. it, Yeah, if, if, if people can still hear me, one of the things that we've now started to do is um, turn off our email income uh, or in, in, inbox, if you like, once every half an hour. So half an hour we're receiving mails, half an hour we're responding to them. Um, and the the other half is productive if you like with other with other parts of the business so i agree with richard that uh, e emails uh, are are a problem if if monitored as often as they come in we we do take time out to monitor them and time out to actually respond to them and those two i've got to be kept separate okay great thank you very much uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have any time for any more questions. We've run out of time, uh, so I'd like to thank uh, all of you uh, for your uh, for your participants for joining us. Thank our pan panelists for their excellent presentations and their advice and expertise. Um, and with that, I wish you all a good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you.